we have the opportunity to be curious. Mm. We have the opportunity to slow down and be still and stop letting the stories that we think we know rule the moment. Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. Today, we have the pleasure of speaking with playwright, writer, teacher, mentor, incredibly talented human being, Sharon Bridgeforth. She speaks to us about her work across the span of 63 years, how she centers African-American Southern migration stories in her work, and what it means to do creative ventures as a touring artist during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Sharon Bridgeforth. I'm 63 years old on Kiz Tangbalan, uh, sometimes called Los Angeles. Um, I use all the pronouns. I love mermaid. That's my favorite. I claim it as a pronoun. Um, And I show up in the world open-heartedly intending to express joy as a spiritual practice. So for me, and I learned this retrospect from my family, I believe joy is the evidence of spirituality. And I think joy is complicated. I think it's hard. You got to do some work. Um, And um, yeah, I look, I think it's transgressive, especially for Black people, for um, queer people, for multi people like myself. Um, So yeah. But it's, 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 and, and I feel like all of my writing has been about trying to get to that through places that I need to heal in order to express that more, through celebrating what I know of my family and our histories, and through excavating the roadmap to that, that is in my blood memory, my DNA and the brilliance of the people that made the space that that I'm standing in, that we're standing in. Wonderful. Well, it is our joy to have you here as our guest on the Zemi Nobla podcast. This is a real treat and something that we're excited about today. There's so many different things we can talk about with you. You are a much uh, celebrated uh, individual who has done just a whirlwind of work. And I'm going to encourage people to go to your website. We'll have the website listed in the show notes for people to go to SharonBridgeforth.com and just see your publications, your residencies, uh, the works that you've had on stage, Uh, just a wealth of of things. And um, to, to really exemplify that, I remember my first contact with you was on the written page when I read an article you wrote for Curve magazine. Mm. And that was many years ago. Yes, it was. Um, And there was something about it that just said, she's my people. (laughs) <laughs> you know, she, she, her, her there, her be my people. Yeah. And I think you have such a gift for, for placing people in that space, not only because you uh, really specialize in centering the histories and her stories of African Americans and the Southern migration of that uh, and spirituality, um, but I think it's probably just native. It seems native to who you are and who you have become as an artist in the world. So let's start talking about that, about home, where you grew up, and your connection to the South and why capturing those uh, stories are so important to you. Thank you so much. That I feel like crying already. <laughs> That's deeply moving and meaningful to me. Um, So I actually was born in Chicago. Um, It was too cold for my mother, uh, who was from Memphis. 
And also, um, we were about to experience homelessness um, because my mother's mother basically drank up all the rent money. It's a long story. I've written about it. But uh, it just so happened that my great uncle, who worked, he was, a, I think, a Pullman porter. He worked for um, the train systems. And he just happened to be in Chicago. He had a car because in addition to his um, work with Amtrak, he also was a numbers runner. And so he had a car, which at that time, I think for black people like us, that wasn't all that common, Mm. you know, Um, working class, southern, you know, newly migrated folks. And so we got in the car and he and my great aunt lived in L.A. So that's where we ended up. And so I grew up in South Central L.A., to be exact, on 98th and Dinker. (laughs) <laughs> and uh but when we first got to LA actually we lived further southeast um by the time I was probably like around eight I think we had moved to 98th and Thinker and that's where I spent the rest of my time but um my mother is from Memphis and she raised me as a single mother my father and my stepmom are from New Orleans and I became integrated into that part of my family as a teenager. So my formative years were really shaped by this, um, my mom and being someone um, that was sent back to Memphis a lot. And so because I spent a lot of time in Memphis, I got to be around a whole posse of great aunts, great uncles, older cousins, because I was the youngest one in the family for a very long time. And my great-grandparents, I have memories of um, my great-grandparents. I used to like to sleep under my great-grandmother's bed. Um, (laughs) They lived in a shotgun house in an area of Memphis called Orange Mound. And I have these distinct memories of just being under her bed and just loving that. And Mm. what I now know is she was... She was actually dying at that point. I feel like we were in some kind of communication. But anyway, they I was young. I was the youngest one. And they just let me do whatever. So I'd be up under that bed, having smiling and just listening, mm. you know, to what was going on. And um, the, the South Central L.A. that I grew up in was a community of black people who were part of the Great Migration. So they were. It was like this huge area of Black Southerners. And L.A. at that time was much more segregated than it is now. And it's still segregated and it's being gentrified and it's like all these things. But during the time that I was growing up, um, it, it that area was specifically Black Americans. And then we had some, as you travel through L.A., then you'd get... Um, um, Black Caribbean people, like it, it had all these little neighborhoods mm-hmm. um, of basically people of color from all over the world and indigenous people. And because my mom was raising me as a single parent, which was um, very shameful, you know, at that time, and she had a posse of uh friends who were also black women from the south who were single parents one her buddies were so fine and i just remember just loving watching them Mm. these fine fierce free black women who were doing their thing and they were away from home so they were just like wasn't nobody checking them you know so they were free in a real certain kind of way also And I think I felt this. And in retrospect, I have been kind of riding my way through understanding this. There was an immense amount of heartache. Mm. There was an immense amount of pain and um, unfairness, you know, that they had to navigate. Um, But I got to, like I went to first grade in Memphis. My great aunts were teachers, two of my great aunts. And so they taught me a love of reading. They made sure that I was really sturdy in my education. And and at a really young age, I actually started school early. And so I carried that with me. And so in Los Angeles, um, 
as my mom, you know, had to do things like put me on the bus at a very young age by myself, Mm -hmm. I just read. So I dreamt everywhere. I dreamt when I watched them. I dreamt on the bus. I dreamt inside of books. I dreamt because I think I came here like that. And I was also very nosy. So I loved watching them. And I just, you know, the older people in Memphis and then my mom and her posse in LA. And I just, I loved them Mm -hmm. and I was amazed by them. And so later when I started writing, which really I started doing as a teenager, because I think I was depressed. Um, I mean, we didn't have that language inside of our household or, Mm -hmm. or, or extensions at that time. But um, what I now know is I was queer. I was a queer bodied lesbian. And I didn't know my, my insides were not reflected anywhere outside. Mm -hmm. And so after I outgrew the age of being a tomboy, which was cute to them because partially then they didn't have to worry about me chasing no boys, but then they realized that was not something I was going to grow out of. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So then it just felt wrong. And so, <laughs> so I started writing because I was a reader. So writing felt like a natural impulse to me. And so I, I had suitcases full of writing that I kept. I still have some of those writings here somewhere. But I think because I was left to my own imagination and, and I, um, even later as I started writing more, more intensely, what I was trying to do was tell stories like my family told stories because I believed that their stories were the best. Mm -hmm. Like the way they told stories was the best. And I still believe that. And I'm still trying to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're in the house and the food is cooking and you're hearing the sizzling and the pots and pans and you're smelling food and people are dancing and Aretha's on and, you know, somebody's praying in a corner, Miss So-and-so's over there crying because God knows I don't know what happened. You know, people are talking at the same time and one is going to kind of be heard. And so a lot of things happening at the same time, but all of it being instrumental in a kind of magic that then I think allowed for us to thrive Mm -hmm. um, despite what was going on in the world, despite hardships, despite fear and trauma. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, they used to say the Eagle fly on Friday. So Friday through Saturday night, they'd be partying Sunday because they weren't at home in Memphis. There'd be church on the rate on the record player. (laughs) And then you clean the house. (laughs) Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All of those um, things that you talked about uh, are flavored in in more or less certain degrees with with black folk all over the country. Because I remember I lived in Portland, Oregon for a, a period of time, and there were a lot of folks there from Mississippi. And they came up during the 50s to work um, in some of the industry there. And I am a native of Kansas, and so my people actually came from Texas. And so there wasn't a lot of that, but there was a flavor of that, enough to make your work and work like that feel familiar and at home because you understand something about just the history of black folks in this country and that need to survive and how... um, Capturing our survival in in artistic ways is just so needed. We still need to survive and thrive. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Yeah. And, you know, I was fortunate to come up as a young person, young adultish person. And there was Cheryl Clark. There was Audre Lorde. There was Mm -hmm. Sheree Moraga. You know, there was Pat Parker. Like there were all these people. And even before I had language to name myself as queer, there was so much. I I think it became possible because of the work that they did, the work that they were doing even before I got a hold of it. I have this vivid memory of being in the car. It took me 10 years to get my BA, but I finally got it. And by the time I got it, I had a small child. So, you know, I thought, you know, I because I didn't 
understand how to name myself in a way that reflected who I really was. And I became a born again Christian. I thought I had to get married and we thought we couldn't fornicate. So I married my dear friend and got pregnant pretty Mm -hmm. early on in the marriage. And it was actually when I found out I was pregnant that I knew I had to more authentically be myself. Mm -hmm. And of course, I didn't have that language for it, but I knew that. Because I knew that if I didn't do that, I couldn't give this child anything. Wow. And so shortly after she was born, I divorced her father. And we worked it out. Like his family is still my family. He, nice Christian man who actually moved to Atlanta after we got divorced, uh, was a chef. And we figured out how to put this child first. And therefore, continue to love each other, but just in a new way. And so, uh, but anyway, there was this moment, my daughter was really little, and I was so exhausted. We were on welfare. I was, um, oh, I was just struggling in so many ways. And I was trying to get this degree. And on the radio, on KPFK was Audre Lorde. And I had to pull the car over. And I don't know what she said, but I know that it opened something inside of me Mm. and it helped me to move forward. And so all those beams of light, having jewels catch one. Because when I did, it was a beautiful young gay man that I worked. I ended up working at some point for Planned Parenthood. I was an intake worker and um, I still didn't know to say You know, like I I just didn't understand Mm. who I really fully was. Uh, And this young man that I worked with, he looked at me and he said, oh, honey, I got to take you somewhere. (laughs) And so he said, meet me at this place on Friday. Child. Mm. Yes, Lord. So anyway, that was like having lightning strike you and shake you into who you are. Oh, I hear so many amazing stories about that. Yes. Oh, honey. Oh, it was everything. What was it it like? Um, First of all, my first memory is of being in line. Mm -hmm. And there are all these gorgeous, different kinds of Black people, different kinds of ways of being queer, just in that line. And the line went up some stairs. And just being there and being just like thrilled beyond really knowing what to do with myself to be in the presence of all of that. And then you you used to go to this little window and you pay your little few dollars and then you get in. And then there was like a bar and a sitting area. And then you went, if you went straight ahead, there was a bar area that was more like, um, you know, like calmer, quiet, like you could go up in there and talk. Mm -hmm. If you went downstairs, it was more like, you know, soul music. You'd be dancing down there in that vibe. If you went left into the big room, it was house music and the light. And so it was, I felt like I got mounted by the Holy Ghost, by the spirit. I feel like the Arisha came down and hit me through my head. I saw all those lights flashing and you're seeing these flashes of bodies dancing and this music did something to you. Um, and it was like, you were free. You oh were my free. Gosh. That, that was yeah. such a, a landmark. If our listeners don't know about Jules Catch One, uh, I know there's an incredible documentary about it and it just yeah. seemed like it was a lifeline for so many people. I mean, more than a yeah. lifeline. It was amazing. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. So I spent a lot of time there and, and it, it really helped me. Mm. Uh, And then in 1998, I ended up moving to Austin, Texas. Um, But uh, that's a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't remember what your question was, but I hope I said something to it. (laughs) No, you did. You know, and we had an opportunity to interview Cheryl Clark uh, for the podcast Uh uh, earlier. Yeah, I heard that. Excuse me, earlier this year. And she's just so wonderful and so gracious. And it just reminds me of how important it is for uh, folks to have access to things that speak to them. 
Uh, and just like you talked about Audre Lord and, and Cheryl Clark, uh, folks have said and will continue to say the same thing about you. You do a great job of mentoring and embracing emerging artists and creating mm-hmm. space for folks. Um, how did that come to be part of your sensibility? And, and how do you maintain that with still mm-hmm. doing the work that you are doing in the world? Mm, thank you so much. Um, I think that, you know, it is part of how I was raised um, to you think about the whole. Mm-hmm. So the, as Toni Morrison said in um, Ancestors Archive, the I is we. Mm-hmm. You know, I was raised by that, shaped by that way of being in the world. Um, and I also, and I have to say, I feel like because I wrote the bus in L.A., And I ended up, by the time I went to high school, I went all the way from my house in South Central to Echo Park, to high school. So I picked, by this time I'm going to Catholic school. So I picked this Catholic school. My mom let me pick where I wanted to go to school. Um, And I picked the school because they said they had karate. I never took a karate class. But anyway, I ended up in Echo Park taking the bus and I ended up I feel becoming a citizen of the world, Mm. navigating inside of deep relationships with people from all over the world, people of color from all over the world. And and I feel like the people of color, earth-based traditions are really rooted in the same way of being. And so the ways that I was nurtured on those journeys also helped shape me. Um, And then all of that for me was rooted in the ways that I was raised at home. But as an artist, (laughs) I started out, uh, initially I was in uh, social services. So when I moved to Austin, I worked for um, the Austin Travis County Health Department managing syphilis cases. Mm. And then I became a part of the, the, that first wave of HIV outreach workers, activists, and early intervention specialists. And that work was innovated by um, Black people that lived in East Austin um, and and Latinx folks that lived in East Austin. And as someone in the health department, because at that time, the health department was not supporting that work, I would just like take their brochures and their condoms and go join up with with my my folks. Mm -hmm. And so I learned through that work, how to be in community in a way that privileged community, in a way that was rooted in love for us, Mm -hmm. in a way that was passionate about our lives. And um, during that time in Austin, as especially compared to now, this is not the truth anymore, but my Austin, Texas of that time was really small. Mm -hmm. And so what that meant was you could really... Like, I feel like I got there, I arrived there, and I just got snatched up. People looked at me and claimed me. Marsha Ann Gomez, Maria Limon, like so many, Ana Cisnet, so many people. And these tended to be women of color. Most of them were queer, who were doing work globally, who were artists, who were activists. And they would just look at me and say, oh, child, come on. And so I ended up uh, doing a lot of work and still am connected with an organization called ALGO. They're a Texas statewide queer people of color organization. But at the time, they were a Latinx um, uh, organization that was responding to the HIV and AIDS crisis. But when those people that were those artists who were activists found out that I had these suitcases of writing they made me share that. Wow. <laughs> I would not have done it. And the very first the public thing that I did, Marsha Ann Gomez put me on program with Cherie Moraga. And Cherie was my, I mean, like her book, Loving in the War Years, I feel like literally saved me. Mm-hmm. You know, that was one of the books that was so important to me. And I was so nervous. And Cherie just walked up and looked at me and she kind of hit me on the shoulder and just pushed me. <laughs> and God knows what I said, read or did, but I survived it. And then after that, they were like, OK. And so we were using art as a way to get people to access services. And so all of that, like 
at some point I felt like I couldn't grow as an artist and keep doing having, cause I had like five day jobs cause I was doing so many different things all connected, but mm-hmm. different. And I felt like to grow as an artist, I had to focus on being an artist, but that came later. Mm-hmm. But at some point during that journey, um, I had started like really, I knew that my work, my writing was for performance. I had started a theater company called the Root Women Theater Company, which thank God I didn't know what it meant to start a theater company. And and I had the nerve to say we were going to tour. And I was just really moving on passion and inspiration after having seen Urban Bush Women perform. Mm. So I was like, Urban Bush Women, Root Women. So that was how the name came. And I'm like, they tour. We going to tour. Just ignorant, thank God. Um, because if I wouldn't have, I would have thought I couldn't do it if I had known. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, so I had, you know, we had been touring and doing things and stuff. And so at this point, Lori Carlos, who was the original woman in blue and the original for Colored Girls, was she was one of the ones that claimed me. She had been bought to Austin, Texas to direct um, my show. She was there. She had come and done other things, mm-hmm. but she was directing one of my shows uh, at that time. And so Lori, so I was there and I was complaining and I was like, uh, 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 and I don't know. And I can't and this and that. And Lori looked at me and she said, you need to go help somebody. And she walked away. Wow. And I, said, mm. I still think about that to this day, but that was why. So I was like, okay. So I started paying attention. And what I noticed was there were these younger artists of color who identified as hip hop artists. And I was really interested in hip hop. Uh, I'm a different generation, so I didn't quite understand a lot about the culture, but I loved what they did with language. Mm -hmm. And I loved how they incorporated visual arts and movement and, you know, all the cypher and the MC and all that. And so I noticed that they were interested in my work. And so I started with my partner at the time. We started having a group of them over to our house every Saturday uh, for a couple hours. And one thing led to another. And I was like, oh, this is actually a great way for me to learn. Not not only learn how to facilitate creative circles, but learn how to grow and be a better artist and be a better person in the world because, you know, it's circular. Mm -hmm. So I may be leading the facilitation, but I'm learning so much. And what I realized was it's for me to have balance. It's really important that I engage and connect deeply in those kinds of ways. And what that does is it keeps me balanced so that I can then write so that I can then collaborate and bringing um, the work to, to life. And it, it, I don't know, it's, 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 it's a way for me to just stay buoyant Um, Now, when I do too much of that and don't do enough of my art, I'm off balance. Mm. So I had to learn that the hard way. Um, But it's a it's a really important part of who I am and how I need to be in the world. And I learn a lot. And let me tell you, them children grow up. Half of them now, they run in institutions. They hire in myself. Me, they, uh, you know, they bosses. (laughs) And they still call me. They call and check on me because, you know, I think I'm 30, but I'm 63. Mm-hmm. And so they call and they check on me, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's a blessing. Yes. And ain't that like how it's supposed to be? Yes. Yes. Uh, and I think that's such a, the gift of intergenerational work when you can be, be honest about how it really is about co-learning. And we don't have all the answers. Those of us who are older and those of us who are younger aren't without um, answers. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And in the midst of, of your generosity and how you give out to people and you're doing your own work, what do you do to kind of bring yourself back in and rejuvenate for the next artistic pursuit or the next encounter of giving out to someone? Mm, thank you. Well, I learned early on, um, because as artists, um, if you're not careful, you're always in the future. You're waiting to receive notice whether you got that grant. You're waiting for somebody to agree 
to produce the work. You're waiting for the check in the mail. You're wait. And early on, I realized that I really needed to create the life I want to live and live that life right now. Mm-hmm. So I um, thankfully, uh, um, that's something that I work on is defining for myself what success is, defining for myself how I want to live and what I want to build this life with, what's important to me. And also integrating um, spirit, body, relationships, mind, like all of it, like the life and the art are not separate for me. And so how am I going to grow um, and, and be more myself. Um, and I think that's like, you know, life work, like that's, that's to me what we're here for. And so also I should say, I started drinking at a very young age. Um, so probably around 10 and I feel like I was a functional, probably not so functional, but I was a functional alcoholic for a long time. I stopped drinking in 1995 and, um, I like so many of us was numbing, you know? And so I literally, and I think this is a lot because I was left to my own devices artistically and encouraged by people that were holy people and that were, they loved me and that were working inside of earth-based traditions. I, I wrote my way and I still do this. I write my way to my growth and my greater capacity to be healthy. Um, so I always have started with in my, what Lori Carlos would call the bone marrow, my own bone marrow. What is the, what is the thing that is showing up that's giving me an opportunity to grow? What is the story of that? And how can I excavate, examine and unearth and release what needs to be released and shift? Mm. Um, in 2005, I had cancer, I had cervical cancer and it really, for me, um, affirmed that it was, it's really important for me to not hold things that are toxic. So hold behaviors, hold resentments, hold, um, practices. And so, that was actually the point where I decided that I wanted to live in a way that expressed joy as the evidence of, you know, spirituality. And let me tell you, that took me into the dark night of the soul. Mm. Cause then I had to say, why are you mad at your mom and your daddy and them? Why you act a fool as a mother? You know, like it, you have to really, so a lot of reflection, a lot of writing. And in my writing, it starts in that very personal bone deep place, mm-hmm. but because I do apply craft and rigor, I do research, I do um, lots of drafts, I do deep collaborations, um, the thing becomes itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but the work has healed me and that's the thing that I reach for. Thank you so much for sharing both of those things, uh, the issue of sobriety and um, cancer, because I think folks are oftentimes very um, hesitant to talk about the ways in in which we've journeyed on this planet and have had to heal. Uh, And Mm -hmm. certainly with the cancer diagnosis and you're coming through that, a lot of that healing seemed not to just be physical, but emotional and things attached to that. And that's just an, an incredible, um, an incredible conversation we could have apart from everything else we're talking about. Um, I'm not for sure if you know, but Zami Noble does a lot of work around breast cancer research. And, and one of the things that's been interesting to me is how so many black lesbians and I'm sure women in, in general are very hesitant to talk about a cancer diagnosis. And, um, but the sharing of the story changes things. And I think more than uh, when we can have more women share stories around any type of cancer or any type of thing that they're trying to get healing from it, it changes the air in this space for everybody, doesn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, cancer runs in my family. I know a lot of it is environment, like all of that stuff. And the thing that I could control, the thing that I could feel really activated around was the internal journey. Mm -hmm. And that became important to me. And as I was going under, as they were going to do the surgery, I remember thinking that all those gripes, all that mad, all that stuff that I was holding didn't matter. I just wanted to live. And so then when I got my energy back, I was like, well, what does that mean? Mm. But I feel like with the cancer, like, and especially as a lesbian, especially as somebody who really is multi-gendered and of all things, it was cervical cancer. So that means they was digging all up in things. Right. It was like, terrifying Mm. and and i and i'm here um but us with the medical system is such a problem that i think it makes it harder for us even when we want to to step into that um you know those clinics or to step into opportunities to to check and see what's going on. And for myself, I knew something was wrong with me a long time before I was actually diagnosed. I didn't at the time have insurance. And so I was going to these little free clinics that were these white women doctors did not like. And I I used to work at that point for the health department. So I knew Mm -hmm. some things Mm -hmm. and I knew how they were supposed to treat me. And I knew that I had certain rights. And I knew that if I tested positive, that they had to try to find me, that they Mm -hmm. had to call me, that they had to send letters, that they had to do things. Anyway, the couple of doctors that I encountered were basically pissed that I was in my own authority and they treated me horribly. Mm. And they never sent me my diagnosis. And so I could have sued them, but I wanted to focus. That was going to be a really hard battle in Texas. And I wanted to focus on being well. So I let it go. But I went back because I knew, and it was like, I haven't gotten any results. I know something is wrong with Mm -hmm. me. So I went to medical records and I asked for a copy of my records. And there it was. I had cervical cancer. Wow. So then I went back later and they had put in that they had tried to contact me and they had not. Um, But by the time I got those actual results, like I knew Mm -hmm. that I had those results by that time I had insurance. And so I was really lucky. I had an excellent oncologist and, you know, I was able to get care and I was just fortunate you know, because it could have gone down very differently. What year was this? This was uh, 2005. 2000, not long ago at all. (laughs) No, not that tall. Right. Not that tall. Right. Yeah. Right. Wow. I just want to stop and and, and take note of that, you know, because I think that we're still still dealing with issues like that around um, um, people of color, queer people of color, not getting the the uh, help uh, that they need in terms of appropriate and adequate health care. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, you know, I, I had, I had a really good question before that because it just, it really, it stumps me. It, it makes me upset. It yeah. really, it angers me because yeah. one of the things that, that I know we, we heard from especially butch women uh, who yeah. had breast cancer was just the the whole issue of of being uncomfortable with yeah. the diagnosis, but but also being uncomfortable in the medical situation where they were not treated appropriately. And, Absolutely, and folks are still dealing with it and not understanding, you know, who it is that that you're talking to and how to treat somebody right and how to uh, offer human dignity. It's just it's just infuriating to me. So I it takes yeah. me off the rail there for a moment. Yeah, yeah. And I have to say, by the time, so once I knew for sure I had that diagnosis and I had insurance and I went to a gynecologist, a wonderful black woman, uh, and my partner, my wife now, my partner at the time, Omi Oshun, Joni L. Jones, went with me. 
when that woman told me, like when she affirmed the diagnosis and was talking to me about next steps, I didn't take it in. Mm -hmm. And so I left that office and I was like, oh, that was a good experience. You know, da -da. and Omi was like, did you hear what mm. she said? Mm. Do you know what we're about to do? And we had to go back. Omi took me back in and had me sit down with the doctor again. Wow. Because even though I knew, I couldn't take it in. Mm -hmm. I was terrified. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so also, for those of us that don't have people that we can trust to be with us, it's so much harder. Yes. It's so much harder. So I feel very grateful. And I had Omi and I had my posse of people and I had, I was very loved and cared for. Not everybody has that. It's terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a shame. Yes. Yes. I think about that now, especially during COVID, when there are yes. so many folks who are dealing with so many health issues and uh, folks uh, aren't necessarily getting the support they need or the attention. And mm -hmm. it's, it's another place where you can just get very uh, infuriating. You know, this is this is a pandemic. It's it's new to yeah. those of us who are in this time and space. And it's just been such a different way of being in the world over the past year, year and a half or so. How have you uh, dealt with this and how has it affected your art and your um, ability to form community outside mm. of your, your home? What has it been like mm. for you? Thank you. Yeah. So I've been a touring artist since 1991. Uh, I work on the road. Um, I know it's weird. I, I came back, Omi and I moved to LA in uh, 2017. So I'd been away from 1989 to 2017. And when I came to LA, I was just coming home. So I didn't come here and work. I have no, I'm like a newbie in mm -hmm. terms of being an artist that lives here. Um, but, but I know how to work on the road. So I, that's been my life. And I was also tired of being on the road. It was beginning to be physically, literally painful to sit on the airplanes where they squish you. It's like they're they squish you more and more and more every year. Um, and I was kind of longing to be home more, but I didn't know how to work from home. I knew how to work on the road. And I have been blessed to have deep, ongoing, long-term relationships with lots of individuals, institutions, and cities, you know, and I, and, and I just, and I follow love. So, I've been very fortunate, but at home, it would just be confusing. Like, I don't know how to do this. Hmm. Auntie, COVID came. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been working from home. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I've done, and I love it. I'm actually pretty introverted. So I need a little, I need some out in the world time, mm -hmm. but I also need actually more quiet time. So I've done, I've taught. I, did, I taught a class for Black Studies at UT Austin. I've facilitated for various um, organizations and institutions. I've done some of my own, you know, facilitation work that I crafted and shaped. I've been writing, you know, like I've been very, very, very busy to the point that not long ago, uh, I ha had to say to myself, I need to be more mindful of what I'm saying yes to mm. so that I can have the kind of spaciousness that I read uh, need in order to, to do what I most want to do right now. So I've been working and then we've been so blessed. Um, my stepmom and my sister got um, COVID, but they got over my stepmom in her eighties, honey mm. got over the COVID. My sister got over it. And then it's like, we just, like my loved ones have really been okay and mm -hmm. we've all been able to take care of ourselves financially and have had health. My mom and my stepdad who live in Inglewood, which is probably about 15 minutes from where we live. And they are some gangsters. They are some, <laughs> but they have cooperated with, you know, what needed to happen for them mm -hmm. to be safe and well. And my daughter 
who is now the boss of all of us. And um, she's an artist. She writes and produces for television and film, but she also has a master's in public health. She puts us in order. She got us all not only vaccinated, but boosted. All right. And, you know, uh, so everybody like we've had a lot of what we need to be okay. Mm -hmm. And so it feels really good. I I am moving into a time where I'm having to really pay more attention and take mindful steps in taking care of my mom and my stepdad. They're, they're, they're good, but then they're also fragile. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm just so grateful that I'm able to be here and my daughter and my, my wife and like, and they have their buddy systems. Um, Cause the one thing that is really hard to see and think about is our elders that are alone yes. and don't have support. Like, um, and, and being with uh, them in the store, particularly my mom, I also witness how, you know, we take care of each other. So all the sweet little beautiful you know, folks that work in all the places that are patient and kind and loving. It's, it's beautiful. Like I've seen a lot of that too. So, um, yeah, yeah. Would you be kind enough to read something for us? (laughs) I would love to. So I'm going to read a short excerpt from the new piece that I'm working on. So this new piece is called uh, Bull Jean and Dem Day Back. And I have to thank Marianne Adams because we had lunch in San Francisco <laughs> a, a while ago. This was, may have been, I don't know what year it was, but maybe let's just say 2015, maybe something like that. And Marianne said, where is Bull Jean? Because Zami was one of the places that really supported me since the 90s, you know. Mm-hmm. And when the Bull Jean Stories came out, which is published by Redbone Press. And I have to send love and shout out to Lisa C. Moore, the founder and editor of Redbone Press. But when the Bull Jean Stories came out in 1998, you know, Zami lifted us, held us, um, gave us space to read. You know, so Bull Jean and I have a deep, long relationship with with Zami. And so Marianne said, where's Bull Jean? And I said, I don't know, because I had been (laughs) wanting to write another well, Jean piece, but I, it was like, she wouldn't talk to me. Mm. And so I've written a lot of other things, but Bull Jean was very quiet. And, and Mary, I said, you know, she old now. And I was like, yeah, she is. Huh? <laughs> and so that just stayed with me. And eventually Bull Jean started talking. Oh, and wow. so this new piece is, um, it's really the narrator is conjuring Bull Jean and actually some characters from other pieces Mm. because the narrator is struggling with how to hold grief and love, Mm. how to be well as we fall apart, how to, how to live in the world in a good way. And so the narrator conjures Bull Jean and them and, um, and, and they come and they, they help. Um, And so I'm being supported by uh, Pillsbury House Theater in Minneapolis and the Playwright Center in Minneapolis in writing this piece. And it's I'm I'm to the point where I have a good draft and I'm going to go into a very small process with Daniel Alexander Jones, who's going to direct it. Um, And, you know, I'll be able to hear it. Mm -hmm. And then that way I'll be able to finish it because I write for performance, I write performance novels, but I need to hear them and see them perform. So I know how to, what to do with them and Mm -hmm. to get the feedback and the experience with collaborators and and, and audience. So anyway, all that to say, I'm going to read this little short excerpt. Stax Lacey voice out all up and around Juicy Lucy's. Big Bill stroke the piano. Bull Jean blow the jug. Together they move in slight sways with sounds that bust the heart open. Ever so slow, they step, sway, step, sway. Yes, sir, them, they keep everybody tilted and on edge. Them, they rock, we roll. They, they tilt, we quiver. Us, we raise, they swagger, all step sway step together we make black heat 
smoked the entire joint till it cracked like thunder. Yes, sir, we bring our own selves to a hallelujah crumble and wail. But what I want to talk about today is they old. That's right. Folk rather fight than hear it said. But truth is, Bull Jean, Big Bill, stacks them, they old. Oh, yeah, they look tasty. Can still stew the room. But I hear they bones creaking. I feel they knees wobbling. I see the slow of day. And I remember when. And two, I know that snacks been sent here because great big mama want her to keep a check on them and they old asses. See, what had happened was, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> oh, what a treat. Oh, lovely. I love it. <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, Mary Ann is just not going to know what to do with herself. <laughs> Tell her I said thank you. <laughs> she pushed me there. <laughs> oh, my. You know, and that's interesting that you are doing this now because I was going to say to you, I said, you know, I remember the bullying stories. And um, I was just watching the recorded uh, performance of um, that black mermaid man. Oh, lady. yeah, man lady. And uh-huh. it was wonderful. And I said, there's just a lot of space between those two things and and what would Bull Jean be now and what would she think of all the different ways in which we are identifying and coming to know who we are outside of just the butch femme uh, identifications yeah. that were then and now there's just a world of uh, you can be a mermaid I mean, a, a, yes. world, a world of things what yes. would she say I mean is she going to speak about any of that now do we know well we're still discovering but I think yes and that Black Mermaid Man Lady is weaves through this piece too. So oh. that Black Mermaid Man Lady and some other characters, uh, a couple of characters from Love Conjure Blues also show up here for the narrator. So um, mm. yeah, they're going to talk about some things. Mm. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are threatened um, who are comfortable just with the the Butch Femme identity are threatened now how we talk about queer and just the whole different range of, of possibilities to that. How do you speak to some some older black lesbians who are comfortable with that identity of Butch and Femme and, and, and aren't very comfortable with the way in which we see just a lot of freedom in terms of younger people identifying as queer, uh, trans, and just not bond, uh, gender nonconforming. I mean, just a whole range of possibilities that now is quite different from what 20, yeah. 25 years ago we were talking about. Yeah. Well, for myself, it's interesting. I thought I had to take on the label of Butch because there wasn't more language. Mm -hmm. I always felt many gendered and I never, it was like, yeah, that fit me, but there was also something else. So for myself, I'm so glad that they are giving us all Mm -hmm. this language and that there's all these different ways. I still don't have the right word for myself. I feel like mermaid, it fits me spiritually in a Mm -hmm. spiritual sense. Um, and, uh, you know, because the divine mermaids are actually undefinable in terms of gender, uh, historically, for real. Um, so I feel like uh, that one works for me. But um, I think that it's we have the opportunity to be curious. Mm. We have the opportunity to slow down and be still and stop letting the stories that we think we know rule the moment. And if we can just be curious and get inside of conversations, I feel like they have the generations now and all this stuff that's coming forward that's new to us um, has so much to offer. And we don't have to change who we are, but um, it could be so beautiful Mm. to just be curious and to listen and to to give, share our knowledge. They they want to hear from us, but if we're so like unbending and judgmental, it doesn't give space mm-hmm. really. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think there's so much to learn from them. I can't this me naming mermaid as as a gender possibility is because a young person who um, was uh, younger than me 
person who is someone that I've been, um, that I have been facilitator of a lot of workshops that they have been in. And, and they are um, very gender non-conforming. I was talking with them and I was like, I, I, I was just really struggling because I wanted a name for myself, mm-hmm. for my gender. And they said, mermaid, you're a mermaid. That changed my life. Mm-hmm. If I hadn't been willing to be in that conversation, I think I'd still be like rubbing up against something hard. And I don't have to. And I use she because I choose to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, well, Sharon, a whole lot that's, of things. that's expansive. That right there, as they say yeah. in church terms, that a preach. That's expansive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That a preach. Thank you. You know, I think it to me, when I hear you say that, it speaks about being in a place of authenticity and understanding who you are and finding language that's comfortable for you to communicate who you are to the world. I love that. Yeah. And if we're paying attention and if we're working and we're 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 doing our work, if we're showing up fully, shit changes. I might have to have a new name later. Yeah. (laughs) And there's freedom. You're free to do that. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. Yeah. I think that's wonderful because some people will say, okay, well, she's a mermaid now. She's going to always be a mermaid. But but Shira says, no, I can change in the future if I want to. That's it. That's it. I love it. Yeah. And you know what? I wonder how much of that. Uh, sensibility comes with also the fact that you're not just mermaid, but that you're a 63 year old mermaid. Yeah, and, absolutely. And, and what aging has gifted you? Uh, absolutely. And so maybe that is the question: What do you see yourself at 63 having having been gifted by by your years? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, right now the most important thing to me is love. And I think it always has been, but I think I've been, I, I, I was hurt and I was neglected in a lot of ways. And I, you know, I have all these things, you know, I have all these wounds and these scars and stuff. And I've done a lot of things to heal those things. You know, I had six parents, so marriages, divorces, whatnot, my daughter's father's parents, my dad, stepmom, my mom, stepdad, three of them have gone. Three of them have passed. I wish I had treasured them more when they were alive. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I'm still learning from them. I feel like I'm still in conversation with them. When they left, I was on good terms with them. So it wasn't, but man, so I don't, with these other three, I don't, I want to love them now. I want to love them right now. And so how can I be more loving? That's the only thing that matters. And, you know, some days I fail miserably. You know, some days I'm not good at it. But it just returns me to trying to be present, being honest, um, practicing joy, and just trying it again. Well, this has been just a delicious conversation. And the, the last question I, I ask my guest is, is there something I left out? Is there something uh, you want to say? Is there a question I should have asked that I, I did not, uh, that, that you think our listeners would have enjoyed you answering? Any, anything else that needs to be said at this point? No, that was a extraordinary conversation. Your questions are so beautiful. Your attention is so divine. Um, And this work, this podcast, which I'm a fan of, is so important. So thank you. Thank you, Sharon Bridgeforth, for being part of our Black Lesbian Herstory. What an incredible conversation. Check out the show notes for a link to her website, SharonBridgeforth.com, and an opportunity to see a recorded performance of that Black Mermaid Man Lady. 
You know, life is amazing, particularly when you've been able to spend a certain amount of years on this planet and stand in your authentic place and name yourself and communicate that with the world. It is such a gift. That is one of the reasons we work so hard at Zami Nobla to center the lives of black lesbians over 40. Thank you for supporting this podcast by listening. And you can also support it by giving us a rating and offering feedback wherever you listen to this and other podcasts. Have a sweet one.